everybody. My name is Kelly Gutnick, and um, I just want to clarify here the B word. So we try to be really catchy. And um, this gal at work, her name is Alice, and she uh, she always gives me very catchy phrases. And um, last year we were just chatting, and she kept asking me when we could have volunteers come and help with the bison because everybody's interested in the B word. So. B word for bison, nothing more than that. <laughs> so just a brief overview. Does everybody at least know what Medewin is or has heard of Medewin? Do I need to give you anything more? I'll just let you. Um, so if everybody's good with Medewin, I'll just keep going. OK. Uh, so we'll just talk about, in general, our herd. Um, the experiment, of course, which is the fun part. Um, we'll talk about. Um, a conservation herd, what that is, and if we have it or not. And um, just a quick discussion over how we handle the bison, and then um, we'll get to some questions. So as every, let's start out. Everybody wants to know what our herd is made of. So right now we have um, five bulls. This stately fellow on the left was the last bull to arrive from Fort Collins, Colorado. So we have five bulls that came from Colorado, uh, 22 cows that came from South Dakota, 13 calves that were born last year, which they are now yearlings this year, and 19 calves that were born this year. So giving us a total of 59. So here's a group of people that you don't know. And um, so the tall guy with the cowboy hat is Matt McCollum. Uh, he is my partner at USDA APHIS um, in Fort Collins, Colorado, again, where we got the bulls. The gal next to him is Lori Swiderski. She works um, for the Forest Service as well in our regional office. The handsome man in all denim is Dwayne Lammers. He has been um, a consultant uh, with us since before the bison arrived. He is kind of a superstar. He did all the work with the bison and dances with the wolves. And uh, so he's, he's a good person to work with. And then the cute couple on the end, um, Jim and Cindy Luter, we got our cow bison, cow bison from them um, from Gan Valley, South Dakota. So when we talk about Medewin, a lot of times we start with a quote from Eliza Steele, which it just says Eliza, it should say Eliza Steele. Anyway, um, she was one of the first persons to actually put into paper um, very eloquently what she would see out on the prairie. And um, perhaps she would see more grass rather than flowers out there, but um, she does make a nice, visual. So as we're going through this and you're picturing bison on the prairie, rather than picture them in some of the photos I'm going to show you, which is pasture, picture them on, with, amongst the five foot, three foot tall grasses and flowers just roaming across the prairie. And that's, this is the landscape that eventually we are hoping to get to. So. The project area that we're working with is just under 1,200 acres. And what you see outlined in red are actual fence lines. And then down the middle, going north to south, east to west, are barbed wire fences. Um, everything else that is in red is a woven high tensile fence. It's five and a half feet tall. And then we have three strands of barbed wire on top. The barbed wire on top is actually for people, not bison, <laughs> and the five feet below is for the bison. So the reason that we have these different pastures is so we can rotate the bison amongst the different pastures as we are doing the rest, as we're going through the restoration process. So why are we doing this? One is just to support our prairie plan. The prairie plan, or we call, um, is a, the prairie plan is guidelines for Medewin. It states our objectives, um, what we plan on doing, our time frame for getting there, and how we plan on doing it. 
And it's because of the Prairie Plan in, two, in the early 90s when they did it that they put bison in there. And that's the reason that we can have bison on Medewin now. So what we want to find out, the two questions we have, do, will bison grazing um, improve the diversity of the native vegetation? And will it also help provide suitable habitat? We say wildlife habitat, and the main component of that wildlife are grassland birds. So what we do hypothesize is that, yes, it will provide suitable habitat, and yes, it will improve the diversity of the native vegetation. Um, in general, across Medewin, but specifically within this project area, we are working on decreasing the invasive plant infestations, increasing the plant species diversity, um, that is native and non-native desirable plants, and then maintaining these areas. And that's um, the important part to remember is that we can restore the area all we want, and that's the quick part, but maintaining the area to keep it how it will structure, how the structure, um, and how it will structure, how the structure and function um, will be appropriate is through maintenance. So in Illinois, bison are considered livestock, the same as cattle. So we have to have them, one, in a fenced area, which you saw. We have to provide adequate food and water, um, and we also have to provide care. But beyond that, um, we also have cattle grazing on Medewin in conjunction with the bison. So what we are also comparing are the way that bison graze versus cattle grazing. Um, bison will move as they graze. So what they will do is they will graze and they will move on. So they're leaving about 50% of the plant there. When cattle graze, what they'll do is stay in one spot, they'll graze it down, they'll all move as a group. Um, bison are more highly selective to grass than cattle are. Um, Bison consume less water. They also linger around watering areas less. Um, they don't go in the water necessarily. And then when you look at some of our cattle grazing pastures, you'll see the bison, or excuse me, you'll see the cattle inside the ponds lingering around when it's hot. Um, so in that way, they do cause more damage than bison do to the um, Water weight, watering areas. Um, bison require less time to staff, which means that we are trying to maintain the herd as wild as possible, but because they are considered livestock, we do have to check on them, but not as much as a cattle rancher would have to do. Um, bison create wallows, wallows um, and trails, I should say, but they create wallows, which are micro, which turn into microhabitats. So um, for your aquatic species, for your um, other plant species. But what they are, they can be as big around as half of this stage and about a six inches to a foot deep. And it just creates a different habitat um, for plants um, and wildlife. So the need for this. Again, to support the Prairie Plan, um, everything that we do on Medewin is in support of the Prairie Plan because what we are doing as a whole is restoring the landscape. Um, to improve and sustain wildlife habitat, again, for this specific project, we have bird habitat in mind, but keep in mind we not only have birds, but we have fox, um, we have coyotes, turkey, so it is, in general, for wildlife habitat as a whole. And then to sustain ecological structure and function. And that is because right now what we have is an area that we have first cultivated. Um, it was in row crops for years. Then we converted it to cattle grazing pasture, which are a lot of non-native grasses, all non-native grasses basically, and um, we have taken the function out of it. We've contoured and 
we've created our own ditches and we've put in wells and so what we want to do with this area is return it back to more of that um, naturally functioning landscape. So this is this process we're going to go through it very quickly. Keep in mind and I'll try to give time frames as we go through it um, but keep in mind again the maintenance of this and that will be the most reoccurring part of this even though I only have it shown here um, in one little block. So typically we have found at Medewin that when we're restoring an area to gain some of the nutrients back we put it into row crops for at least three years. After that we plant it with the native grasses and forbs. We do maintenance and monitoring which would be herbiciding, prescribed burning, grazing. We'll do supplemental plantings. Then we'll go back to the maintenance and monitoring. And then we'll either introduce bison grazing, of course, for this project, or cattle grazing, always going back to the maintenance and monitoring. So our desired condition. Across the Medewin landscape, there is a lot, we have a lot of leftover infrastructure from the Army, whether it's buildings or in the picture in the um, left-hand corner is a bunker being taken down. Um, but our desired condition is one in which we have, let's just say for right now, a lot less of the infrastructure. We're returning to our natural regi regimes, um, which I'm going to have to say prescribed fire because I don't think we will ever have wildfire on the day when, but who's to say. Um, grazing of the bison, which it is anticipated that if this project works out, um, we could have bison grazing across the entire 20,000 acres of Medewin rather than just 1,200 acres of Medewin. Um, and then we would get more back to the Eliza steel landscape, which you can see in the bottom left-hand corner just the rolling prairie um, mixed with savanna, and then of course bison grazing on there. So what have we been doing so far in this 1,200 acres? We've done nutrient testing of our soil, water, and our vegetation. Um, we mainly did that because of what was there. We'll just say the arsenal in general. Um, we wanted to see through the testing if what was once residual in the soil was still there. Also, if it was in the, still in the water. And then if it was growing in the vegetation which the bison would be consuming. Um, we continue to do habitat monitoring which, um, for upland birds. Um, we do our wallow surveys. That is, where are the wallows? How big are they? What, what was growing there before? What may be growing there now? And we'll continue those types of surveys. And then we do pasture rotation. Um, we have current, the bison came and we had them in the northwest pasture. Now we have rotated them into the northeast pasture and then we will continue that rotation. Um, again, with the habitat maintenance, we've done prescribed fire, we've done brush cutting and tree removal, we've done seed planting, um, and then we've done invasive species control, whether that be by herbicide, uh, manual labor by mowing, um, but a lot of it is in the habitat maintenance. So we're going to do a little bit of a transition now rather than talking about the landscape and what we're doing and actually talk about um, the bison themselves. So we all know that from the time we've started talking about bison, um, they have been, they're called a keystone species and we've used them used, utilize them for every part of the bison, whether it's consumption, whether it's um, education, whether it's for building homes or for clothing, but every part of the bison is respected and every part of the bison is consumed. So the bison actually really fit into the name Midewin um, as being as part of the healing process of the prairie, healers themselves, if you will. So there's a group, it's called the Bison Conservation Working Group. And really this group is nobody in particularly special. 
It's made up of scholars. It's made up of bison herd managers. It's made up of your general interested public. But this group has put together a document that kind of outlines what it takes to be a conservation, to put together a conservation herd. And the reason that I follow this with our herd management is because it can be easily adapted from something from an area as small as 1,200 acres to an area as large as 50,000 acres. Um, so this group runs on three principles. One, to maintain the wild characteristics. That is, letting the bison interact with each other, letting them interact with their habitats, maintaining mixes of age classes and sexes. Um, there is one, there are two contingencies in there. One, to have a, si a herd size of 500 and to have a land area of 5,000 acres, which obviously Mendewin won't have yet, doesn't have yet, but we could have, or in partnering with other areas, um, we could also obtain that as well. Um, the other principle is conserving genetic diversity and genetic integrity. That is not breeding for certain traits or not culling, that is not removing a bison because it has a certain trait. Um, but there are contingencies to that as well. That is because the bison are in a confined space, um, if you have one that continues to break through a fence or to be aggressive towards the handlers, you probably want to get rid of that bison. And by get rid of, I mean not kill, just maybe trade it somewhere else. Um, and then the last principle would be to restore and maintain biodiversity and ecosystem functions. Again, let predators be predators with the bison. Let them interact. On the day when the bison have no predators. They have, we have coyotes out there. Um, we've seen them around the herd, but really they're not going to do much. Um, as far as maintaining ecosystem functions, again, rather than putting in a well, even though we have to because in Illinois they're livestock, so we have to make sure they have perennial water year round, but that is letting them access these streams, whether they're perennial or intermittent, um, letting them graze freely. And we're doing that for the most part, except for, like I said, we will be rotating them through the pastures, but we're not keeping them in a super confined space. And then another one would be um, a big deal with genetics is that we want to avoid having any sort of cattle gene, any sort of cattle allele within your herd. But with that, they don't, the working group says, not to get rid of a bison just because it has, it may have a cattle allele. Because in doing so, you could be getting rid of an important trait that no other bison has. So it is a fine line between, do you want to have a clean, pure herd, or can your herd still function the same way without getting rid of that bison? So there are also three herd designations. And these herd designations have to do with how in line your herd management is to the three principles from the last page. So I'm going to go ahead and say that midday wind falls actually within all three of these currently. We don't have the 5,000 acres for them to graze on, and we don't have 500, a 500 head herd. So we cannot really call ourselves um, a conservation herd because right now we don't meet all of the criteria for that. But um, so a contributor to a conservation herd is simply saying that you have a herd and you are using that herd to perform restoration um, within an area. Yes, we are doing that with our herd. A conservation herd is one in which you have the proper herd size on the proper land area, you're doing um, land maintenance, that is restoration activities. Um, and then the last one, the bison conservation herd with ecological restoration, is that you're following all three principles and you meet all of the guidelines within those principles. 
So this is my favorite part, uh, the handling part. It's my favorite part to talk about because um, it was brand new to me. And um, when I got to Midday Wind, people kept calling me the bison lady, which I had no idea what they were talking about because I don't remember in my interview ever getting that question, like, have you, have you worked with bison? I remember, because I came, I came here from Grand Teton National Park, and I would ride my bike to work, and I would ride past a bison herd, and that was like my interaction with <laughs> bison. So I guess that makes me an expert. Um, but the handling part has been um, one of the most fascinating parts to me, and I hate to say, but I love to say that um, my interest is now leaning less towards the restoration part and more towards the handling and um, the behavior of the bison part. Anyway, so um, again, the same picture just depicts the 1,200 acres that we have and the four pasture system. So the tiny square in the center is what you see blown up over here. So when we work with the bison, we have five people that go out with the herd. Those five people um, are the only people that handle the bison. We have one pickup that goes out there. It's the only pickup aside from the veterinarians that they see. The reason that we keep it at five people and one pickup is because we're trying to create an association between the bison, those people, and the bison and that pickup. When they see the veterinarian's pickup, no joke, they will take off. Because as we have had to treat them for pink eye, they um, get darted. And it's just a quick shot. They just get a quick dart. But they have associated that vehicle with getting a dart. From the vehicle that we have, they associate that with getting bison cakes, which are just alfalfa cakes with some molasses in them, and they come to that pickup because they know it's a safe bet, they're not going to get darted, and we're not going to take them anywhere they're going to get hurt. So we do all things with positive association around the herd because we are not trying to be, we're not trying to relive the Wild West stigma as we handle the herd. Um, we don't push them places, we pull them places, hence the truck, hence the cakes. So as easy as I'm going to make it sound is really as easy as it is. Um, so w right now, when we have the bison out in the larger pastures and we want to rotate them into a different pasture, what we will do is go around the herd, drop some cakes out of the pickup, they will follow the pickup, we will take them into this central area that you can see here, and we shut the gate. Then we will open a new gate, and we will put cakes out the pickup, and they will follow us into another pasture. So not only do we do that to rotate them through the pastures, but if you know where Medewin is, there's Highway 53, there's Intermodal Station, the Abraham Lincoln Cemetery, Highway 55, um, there's a lot going on around there. So if the bison, by chance, get out of their confined air, their fenced area, then we have a way to at least attempt to get them back in to where they should be without our first instinct having to be to put them down. Um, and so far, it works very well um, to get them to come with us. The other reason is because, again, as they are considered livestock in Illinois, we do have to run them through um, a shoot system every year and do a health check on them. And so that makes it safer for them because they have access to what you can see um, just looks like a little puzzle piece maze in there. That's our corral system, but they have access to that year round. We do put water troughs in there because we do like to draw them in, but it's an area that they're not forced into and it's not an area that they only have access to once a year where we pull their tail hair and draw their blood. It's an area where we pull their tail hair, draw their blood, and then they can come back into that area year round um, to get comfortable. 
So when we handle them, what we do is we take them from a larger area, which would be one of the four pastures. We will put them into the small red square in the middle, again, the area that's blown up, and we'll shut them in. So we start um, four or five days before we do the roundup, and we're going to move them from a larger space to a smaller space to get acclimated. From the smaller space, which would be um, this whole area right here, we will move them into this area, so it's about half the size. And we will let them sit there for about a day or so. And then after that, we will cut them off to a smaller area, so then they will only have access to the corral system and this pasture here. And we'll just let them stay there for a little while so they get comfortable. At that point, we've moved them from such a large area to a smaller area to a smaller area that they're used to being large animals in a small area. So the day then that we go to work them, we just open the gate and we have a couple people that will walk behind them and push them through the alleyway and then that's where our process begins of running them through the chute system to check them um, health-wise. So this is the top of our corral system. And um, is, there, is anybody familiar with the name Temple Grandin? OK. So if you were to take this design and look in Temple Grandin's book, Humane Livestock Handling, you would see this picture. So um, she is, just very quickly, she is known for her humane livestock handling methods. And the design of this is one, the curvature. It has been said that livestock, that is bison and cattle, have a best friend. And that's, that's really true. And um, when you take away their best friend, it causes a lot of anxiety. But um, so what they see is their friend going through one zigzag area. They disappear, and they want to know where they're going. So there's no corners, really, for them to get trapped in. That's hence the zigzag of it all. Then this area here is further divided. So we will shut the gates right here and down here in four different spots. And we will shut probably five bison in each section. And through that, and then from there, if there are bulls in with calves, we will divide them out because bulls tend to get a bit more aggressive. And um, the handlers have helped at other roundups. And um, bulls have been known to take a calf and send it flying somewhere else. So we try to avoid that, of course, as much as possible. Um, so from there, we put them into the chute system. We only like to keep them into the chute system for maybe 65 seconds, 75 seconds tops. When they're in the system, we will take the tail hair from the calves, that is so we can get the DNA. Um, we can do parentage testing from there. We will draw blood for nutrient testing. Um, we do not do any pregnancy checks on the cows. Um, we will treat them for pink eye. If they are female calves, we will give them a bang shot, which is um, a shot for brucellosis and tuberculosis, which is required of them, of us to give to them to be within the state of Illinois. Um, and then we will send them straight back out to the pasture. And so just a quick, since we've only done one roundup, I just want to tell you how that went with the handling methods that we just described. So it took us about a half day to run um, 40 bison through our chute system. We had no injuries to staff. We had one, we had two horn caps fall off, which was in essence very menial, um, and no bison fatalities, so that was good. Um, and what we did there, or what we found out through there, 
through that was, one, our bison were all healthy through the nutrient testing. We had three calves that were born very late in 2016. Um, we found that they were actually conceived on Midaywin, which I should have told you a while at the beginning. Um, when the cows came, they were already pregnant, not from these bulls, except for the three surprises that came later, which were in fact conceived at, on Midaywin. Um, and then we also had to run some testing to make sure that there were five bison in question, so we ran testing to um, check their genetic material, and we did find some cattle alleles in those bison. Um, but other than that, everything went very smooth. And that's all I have for you. <laughs> yes. So are the bison uh, marked like cattle with ear things, or so you know each one? So, so as you can see in these pictures, they did have tags on them, but it was, um, it really took away the aesthetic appeal for people to see the bison with purple, yellow, blue, and red tags. So we took them out. However, when you're out in the field and you have a bison with pink eye, and you're expected to find that same bison in a herd of 50, it's very hard to do without the tags on them. So this year, I'm going to put tags back. They're going to be black tags. So they will not be as visible, but they will still have a number on them that I can see from a binocular because other than that purple tag, they just get one clip tag and it's impossible to see under all of their hair. But yes, so they have been removed as of now. Good question. What else? This is my favorite part. <laughs> do you do any uh, burn on the prairie at all? Burns on the prairie? Yes, we do. So this year we burned um, 3,700 acres. And one of the pastures was the bison pasture, the pasture they're currently in. And we will hopefully be able to continue that burning regime. I just, I can't help but I have to ask why I get the peak eye so much. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking so. yeah. Well, a lot of times, I mean, even with cattle, you can get pink eye from stress. You can get it from just simply walking through the grasses and having something touch your eyeball lens. And then, of course, it can be spread easily. So we try to watch that, especially right now where grass heights are at three and four feet. Um, we try to watch that very closely. Uh, we just had a cow and her calf, um, both with eyes that were watery and runny. The cow could not see out of either one of them, and her calf couldn't see out of one, and, but her calf was leading her around, and so we had to treat them right away. So I think it's just a lot of irritant. Good question. Mm -hmm. Um, why not a under the skin sensor that would have a number and actually give you like GPS data? So that's a good question because um, the cow bison actually do have a chip in them right now. And it does store any of the data that we collect during the roundup, that is age, weight, um, any mineral deficiencies they may have, any health issues they may have. Um, the problem is getting the compatible reader to go with that. And the gentleman that we got the cows from developed his own chip and his own reader, and we don't have access to that. So they do have that, and that is available, yes. Mm -hmm. Co will it cause problems? Oh, a cost problem. It's not a cost problem in that we can't afford it. It's a problem in that we can't justify being able to get it right now. I don't know. I wish I knew. I would. I wish I knew, or we'd have the chips. I would say. Can tell you what justifies that? No. <laughs> Thank you. 
So what are the plans for expansion, or is there a plan for Good question. So on the area we have outlined right now, we can sustain just over 100 bison. So we will get our herd to that size, but we will also, in the meantime, maintain the herd size because our project is projected to last 15 to 20 years. So if we see um, any sort of significant decline in the ecosystem, we can shut it down. Or if we can continue, if we can use bison grazing as part of our restoration process, and again, we're meeting the goals, our desired goals, that is um, the decrease in um, non-natives, undesirables, and invasives, and an increase in our, in our natives and desirables, then we can continue the project going. As far as expanding it across the prairie, I think right now that's just a dream. But that's what this experiment is for. Start small and then dream big. How much did it cost to get the bison to my neighbor? <laughs> so, um, so how much did it cost to get the bison to Midday? When it is a good question um, because we didn't do it all on our own. We had, had and have partners that one helped with the infrastructure, pay for that, which was not cheap, um, pay for the bison themselves. So the going rate of a bison is between five and ten thousand dollars a piece. Is that what you were looking for? You want to? Okay. <laughs> um, and then, of course, um, the time and the manpower it takes to run what seems like a pretty easy program to run. But as far as infrastructure costs go, you're looking at just over a million dollars. I, I saw them one time when I was there, and when the bull would move, they would all follow him. Does the whole herd follow one bull? So, <laughs> not necessarily. And the reason that I'm sort of hesitating right now is because we have the bison in one pasture. Does and the most desired thing would be to have multiple pastures open to them because bison break off um, into one matriarchal groups, even though they're all females in this group and all females in that group. They, it's not that they don't like each other, it's just their natural instinct is to break off into groups. The males typically will break off as well until it's time for the ruts, that is the mating season. So not always do they do that, do they follow a male around, but because right now, um, well it's better now, they have multiple pastures to go into, but because they were in one pasture all together for so long, their pecking order was just that. They had a male at the top, even though bison tend to, tend to be very um, matriarchal. So no, that does not happen all the time. What else? Uh, considering genetics is important, mm -hmm. and places like Inchusa, Kinky Sands also have bison. Yeah. Is there a mechanism in place to trade bison between those like other yeah. populations? So, yes, not necessary for us. It would be of convenience to be able to trade with Nechusa as well, but because our bison come from a different lineage than theirs we will, st ours are Yellowstone lineage, um, we will have to partner with outside, outside groups. But yes, that is exactly what we're intending to do. Mm -hmm. What else? To be at the 100? So at the rate we're going, at, we currently have 59 bison, it would only take a couple years to reach that. However, we are getting to the point where the yearlings, that is even the bulls, the bull yearlings will be able to mate within another year or so. So we're going to need to trade them out. Um, so our herd will be reduced in size. Um, so 
it'll take a little, it'll take a little while with our management. That's a good question. What else? When is running season and how long is pregnancy? <laughs> yeah. <Why not? laughs> so pregnancy um, typically lasts nine months and um, they're going through the rut right now. And um, when you go out there, it is the wildest sound coming from a bison that you've ever heard. It sounds like a group of lions out there. The bulls stick their heads down, they stick their tongues out, and this ghastly sound just comes from their whole entire body. And uh, not something you would expect from a bison. <laughs> and it'll last about um, a month. Bloodlines of these bison, how far back do they go back? Like, all right, in the 1800s, they were running wild. There were millions of them. Right. right. And of course, is any part of that, you, I mean, of course there is, but I mean, where, where did the lineage come from, or did it start at when they started saying, okay, we got to do something, or we're going to lose them all? Sure. So that's a really tough question for me to answer only because I only know that they are of Yellowstone lineage. If we were to say around the Midwest, there were not thousands upon thousands of bison going across the prairie. You would have saw, you would have seen hundreds maybe of bison going across the prairie. Um, their lineage, the bulls are direct lineage from um, Yellowstone descendants and then the cows as far as I know as far as what we can test for are as well but I'm not sure exactly how to answer that stumper <laughs> mm -hmm. I was going to ask something related I thought I'd wait but it kind of um, relates to this question um, I had watched so I was just looking it up now the Brock Zoo's TV show that they started um, on Animal Planet last year I think it was or Okay. And they have, they're claiming the first pure bison breeding program. Okay. So they're talking on here as far as the 1900s, and uh, they were down to like 1,100. And then they sent two pure bison out to us to reestablish. And that's what I was going to ask is, um, they have, I forget her name, there's a, a doctor, um, <laughs> But she's tracking the purebred bison and um, doing like in vitro and making sure that it's diverse. Mm -hmm. And they were showing that actually and pregnating, you know, uh, females and stuff like that. Is there a point? I mean, is that the goal? Is to eventually just have purebred bison down the road, or is there an advantage to having the bison that are cattle bison right now? Or where, so it is? depends on. Um, to answer that, it depends on what your intent is. If your intent for us is to use them for restoration only, then it wouldn't matter if they had any of the cattle alleles in them. But we also want to have a conservation herd. So for us, yes, we want to have as clean of genetics as possible. Um, if we were in it for industry, that is for meat, Again, we probably wouldn't care. Um, but I have, an, I have a problem with them saying, and I'm no expert. I'm just going to say that. I'm no expert. But I have a problem with them saying pure genes only because we can only test so far as far as genes go. And um, so to say that they're pure, we can't test every single allele within a gene. Um, so I understand what they're saying, but I don't know. I guess I have to claim ignorance. I don't know how far they can actually take that testing. And that's, I've been working with Texas A&M, and right now we're testing 16 alleles, and they have now that they can test 1,200. So it's the more testing that you can do, the better. But to say that they're pure, 
I don't think that we'll ever be able to say that because at one point there wasn't a pure bison. Anyone else? Okie doke. Vicki, I'll let you make the call. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>